well welcome to this lecture my dear students this lecture is on the topic of a few convexity preserving operations that means we are going to discuss a few operations that preserve convexity towards this let's suppose we are given a pair of convex functions now i take their addition their subtraction their multiplication or their composition my question here to you is that whether these functions are going to be again a convex function or not if we look back our last lecture we will find that we have discussed first order and second order characterization of convexity of a given function in first order characterization we can find that we have discussed about a global lower bound from a given local information if we know the gradient information at a point x bar in the domain of definition of a given function and if the function f is known to be convex then with the help of the gradient at the point x bar you find the tangent line or tangent plane or tangent hyperplane in the graph of the function and that tangent plane is a global lower estimate for the function value of the given function that we have seen in the first result of the first order characterization we have also seen another first order characterization in which we have found that convexity of a function is essentially implying monotone increasingness or monotone non decreasingness of the gradient function of the given function and vice versa both the results result 1 and result 2 for the first order characterization they were both necessary and sufficient conditions for convexity of a given function on an open convex set that we have seen on the last day and later on from the result 2 of monotone increasingness of the gradient in the first order characterization we have guessed that uh, the second order characterization is nothing but the second order derivative of the function is non negative or for function of several variables the hessian is positive semi definite throughout the given domain of definition capital s which must be given to be open and if it is not open the result that f is convex implying f has positive semi definite hessian might not be true we have seen this result and this result is true vice versa way that if the hessian is positive semi definite on an open convex set then the function must be convex and also if the function f is convex then the hessian matrix must be positive semi definite in the given open convex set which is the domain of the definition of the given function fine well so let's start our class with a few convexity preserving operations let you have a pair of convex functions let f1 and f2 be convex on their respective domains a in the domain of f1 and f2 you can think of capital s1 and capital s2 be convex i'm not explicitly writing in their respective domains and uh, then And then let me mention that f1 plus f2 is convex convex on the intersection of the domain of definitions of the functions f1 and f2 is convex but however f1 minus f2 f1 composition f2 provided this composition is well defined f1 times f2 f1 by f2 provided this f1 by f2 is well defined none of these four functions may not be convex i put it as a home task to find respective examples showing that f1 minus f2 is not convex f1 composition f2 is not convex and product or division also is not convex fine now uh, next ahead let me give you the first result on convexity preservation the first result towards this is the following the first operation that i would like to mention here is first operation operation 
that is the non-negative weighted sum of a few convex functions is convex. To be precise in the statement that if f1, f2 till fk are convex on their respective domain let's say dome of fi i equals to 1 2 up to k if this then the non negative weighted sum alpha i f i x this function i equals to 1 to k where alpha i's are all greater than equals to 0 is a convex function obviously in their intersection region fine for the proof proof is very easy but still let me just hint you out here we do not have much time to prove all the things explicitly otherwise the entire syllabus will not be finished up um, you also have to be little studious in this time otherwise if you don't do little homework or if you don't try on your own you may not get a particular interest on this topic and therefore it is suggestive for this course that whatsoever homework i am giving you please follow them up because this homework might be useful later day in the development of the algorithms and unless you are aware of all these results things will be difficult slowly the course progresses anyway so uh, for the proof here uh, let me take a notation for the intersection for the set in which we need to prove the convexity let's suppose it is the set capital s so now if s is empty then obviously the result is vacuously true that there is no point to check of convexity the result is vacuously true fine and trivially the result is followed if non-empty if s is non-empty then take a pair of points consider a pair of points that x1 and x2 belonging to the set s and as well consider a lambda in between 0 and 1 and then you prove the inequality for the definition of convexity so here let me take here Mm, a notation for the summation function let me say it is my phi x fine and for this phi x what we have to prove that that phi of the convex combination of x1 x2 is less than equals to the convex combination of the phi values at x1 and x2 how do we prove it so uh, it is very straightforward now we note that phi of lambda x1 plus 1 minus lambda x2 is by definition it is given by summation i equals to 1 to k alpha i times f i of lambda x1 plus 1 minus lambda x2. Here you note that individually if we consider this function f1, f2 or f i this fi is less than equals to lambda times fi at x1 plus 1 minus lambda times fi at x2, right? That is because fi is a convex function. And uh, now once this alpha i is multiplied on both the sides and then you take summation over i equal to 1 to k, then what it will give us is the following it will give us the following sum that this is less than equals to this is less than equals to summation over i equal to 1 to k alpha i times this and this this inequality f i if i to this lambda if i this inequality is retained after multiplication of alpha i because alpha i is non negative because all alpha i's are non negative for all i fine and this will give you 
and it is done because this is your 5x1 this is your 5x1 and this is your 5x2 and the result is followed that the function pi is convex fine now next result is the operation next result is the operation 2 which is a point wise maxima operation 2 here we will consider a point wise maximum by point wise maximum I mean you take any point x and if there are a few convex function given to us f1 f2 fk and you take any x any x in the domain of the definition of pi which is given by s is the intersection i equals to 1 to k domain of a phi inside this you take any x and define phi x given by maximum of the function values f1 x f2 x till f k x out of this k many real numbers for any given x Obviously, f1 x is a real number, f2 x is a real number, fk x is a real number. Out of this k many real numbers, you choose the maximum one. And out of this maximum one, the value you assign to phi x at the point x. Fine, this is how phi x is defined and that's why it is called point twice maximum. You take any x, then phi x value is given by maximum of the values f1 x, f2 x and fk x. So here, let be convex on their respective domain fine then the point wise maximum function phi x defined on the set capital S is convex on capital S the proof is again straightforward let me just hint you out Again, we take a pair of points x1, x2 and lambda in between 0 and 1 and then you note that phi of lambda x1 plus 1 minus lambda x2 is obviously for any given fixed lambda in between 0 and 1. We note that this phi is the definition maximum of these values that if i lambda x1 plus 1 minus lambda x2 right and this maximum is over i ranging from 1 to k fine now you note that this f i as it is a convex function is less than equals to lambda times f i x1 plus 1 minus lambda times f x2 and therefore the ith component inside this maximum is less than equals to this so f1 function value of f1 at this point is less than equals to this much right at f2 the function value at the same point converse combination of x1 and x2 is less than equals to lambda times f2 x1 plus 1 minus lambda times f2 x2 fine so individually for every i equal to 1 to k you have this inequality is true so maximum over this then f1 value, f2 value, fk value is obviously less than equals to maximum over these values. Fine. 1 less than equals to i less than equals to k. Fine. And here as lambda is positive, so we can, we can pull this lambda out and then it is maximum over i equal to 1 to k f i x1 plus 1 minus lambda times maximum over i f i of x2 now this is sufficient hint and you can now straightly get the result that is stated in the convexity preserving operation 2 now let me give you the next convexity preserving operation operation 3 is the partial minimization in partial minimization what do we mean 
by that we state the following result let's suppose i have a function as follows if gxy is convex on the non empty convex set capital s which is a subset of m plus n dimension and the component x in the argument of g is taken from rm and y is taken from this rm fine and it is convex on this non empty convex set so we assume that this is a non empty convex and also we assume that it is a convex set fine then we take the following function f x given by corresponding to this particular x x is taken from r n for a given x let's suppose it is x bar and if x bar is given by the minimum most value of the function g x bar y so here y is a variable and this y is obviously um, that for, uh, from this is it can be thought of this s1 cross s2 and if we project this s on r n sorry uh, here this is my rm because here rm i have taken so if you project on projection on projection of s this projection has to be the, on the set rn fine to so the component so you vary y on s and you fix x corresponding to the given x the minimum most value of g x y keeping this x fixed you take the minimum most value of the function g and that will be the function value f x if this function is well defined if f x is well defined by that what do we mean by that we mean that for each x there exists one y such that or rather for each x dash there exists one y dash such that f of x dash is equal to g of x dash y dash fine and if it is well defined uh, then the function f must be convex obviously where if you take the projection of s on the m dimensional euclidean space r m fine now for the proof again not that straightforward but really again straightforward uh, as like the earlier two operations let me still give you a hint here the hint is as follows that let's suppose now to prove the convexity of f again a pair of points x1 x2 you take and also take the converse combination uh, lambda x1 plus 1 minus lambda x2 and you prove the defining inequality for convexity and let's suppose let's suppose for x1 fx1 as f is assumed to be well defined there exists one y1 such that fx1 is gx1 y1 let and also let f of x2 is equal to gx2 y2 fine then f of lambda x1 plus 1 minus lambda x2 this is by definition of the function f as again the function f is well defined so you must have a point let's suppose some value y bar let's suppose let this and this and also f is given by lambda x1 plus 1 minus lambda x2 y bar but this y bar is such that this is the minimum most right minimum most of what that minimum most of g this value is lambda x1 plus the first component is fixed and you vary y fine this is minimum most and once this is minimum most obviously this is less than equals to g of lambda x1 plus 1 minus lambda x2 first component keep as it is 
Now instead of y bar, we consider lambda y1 plus 1 minus lambda y2. Fine. If lambda y1 plus 1 minus lambda y2 is y bar, that is also possible. In that case, it will be equality sign instead of less than equal to. If this is not y bar, then this is a point in the domain of the definition of f. Fine. In the domain here in this projection of s over r n. And therefore, as y bar gives us minimum most value, therefore, this is less than equals to g at this point, right? Well, and uh, as g is convex, therefore, we note that fine, this is sufficient hint. You can now conclude the result. Now, let me move ahead to the next result the operation preserving convexity 4. The operation preserving convexity 4 is the following that is the composition of a convex function with an affine map. As I have mentioned earlier that composition of a pair of convex functions may not be convex and now we have the following composition that convex function and in the argument if you give an affine map gives us output a convex function fine to be precise the statement is the following that let g from r m to r be a convex function and uh, if it is not mentioned the domain then the domain is the entire m dimensional Euclidean space and h uh, which is defined from Rn, output is Rm, B an affine map. And obviously by this affine map, you will have certain expression like A times X plus B, where A is a matrix of order M by N, X is a vector, column vector, and B is a vector in from Rm. If g is a convex function and h is an affine map then the composition g of h is a convex function convex function obviously it is defined on the n dimensional Euclidean space a proof i am giving you as a home task this is really a trivial proof i am not going to prove it for operation 5, we follow the following. In the next operation, again regarding composition, is the following that convex composition with convex might not be convex. For instance, um, okay, let me not give you a certain example because I have, I have given you it as a home task. But you will really find that it is composition is not a convex function. Fine and uh, but if we take convex composition which is a monotone non-decreasing or increasing function so if we have a monotone increasing convex function and if you take composition with a convex function then it will give output as a convex function fine and to be precise the statement is the following that let g be a monotone non-decreasing of one variable and h is convex r n to r a multivariate convex function b a monotone increasing convex function convex function and h is also convex then if you take g of h then it is also convex obviously convex on r n fine again this is trivial i am not going to prove it if i skip everything that is also not good let me just give you a hint here that why the increasingness is required this is due to the following fact that if your function h is convex then you know that h of lambda x1 plus 1 minus lambda x2 is less than equals to lambda of h x1 
plus 1 minus lambda h x to right. Now, if I take composition with a g which is not monotone increasing, then this inequality might get reversed. And if it is monotone increasing, then this inequality will not get reversed. Fine. That if g is convex, then obviously here g of h x1 plus 1 minus lambda g of h x2 and you are done, right? Well, and therefore it is sufficient in that convex composition with convex is not convex. Sufficient hint in the sense that you take then this g which is not monotone increasing, take a convex function that is not monotone increasing. And in that case you will find that the composition with composition of convex to convex function is not convex. Fine. Now with this, um, although there are several other operations like perspective map, also several other, I'm not going to detail them up, but here, uh, but a few operations are going to come out in the tutorial sheet or the problem sheet. There I will mention a few more operations which preserve convexity. And once you know a few operations that preserve convexity, uh, this will be really helpful, all these operations will be really helpful to find convexity of a given function. If we always move uh, to check convexity with the help of the defining inequality, f of lambda x1 plus 1 minus lambda x2 is less than or equal to lambda fx1 plus 1 minus lambda fx2, it will be disaster. Because if it is a simple expression, if the function has a simple expression, sometimes you can hang around a little and you might get the inequality. However, if the expression is little cumbersome, then it will be difficult to check. And if you cumbersome expressions, I will give you in the tutorial sheet or the problem sheet and you will find that by defining inequality of convexity you will not be able to check not be able to check means it will be really tedious and sometimes you will fail and in those cases to check the convexity what you can do is three particular ways the first way is that way one if the function f is differentiable then you apply first order characterization for checking the convexity. That means you prove um, either gradient is monotone increasing or the tangent is a global lower bound. Fine. So first order characterization you will use. First order characterization of convexity. Then if the function is twice differentiable, then you can also equally apply, which is rather widely applied usually if the function is twice differentiable then second order characterization that you check second order characterization you check that the hessian is positive semi definite or other way is use convexity preserving operations if first and second are not easy to check or difficult because positive semi definiteness checking is also not an easy task and first order characterization also requires certain inequalities, right? And also you can use zeroth order characterization that uh, along every possible direction, let me also put as OA4, that use epigraph characterization or um, that the function phi t is given by f of at any point x plus t times any direction you take. Is convex so you have four ways to check convexity that either you can also have one another way where you can use um, the defining inequality itself but that will be not always easy and therefore we have four particular ways uh, to check convexity is the first one is way zero you check with the definition defining inequality or you use the first order characterization or you use second order characterization or use convexity preserving operations or you use epigraphic characterization that epigraph is convex or the function f is convex along every possible direction d fine this is how we can check convexity of a given function. With this I end up for convexity preserving operation and let me move ahead to a new topic that is the unconstrained optimization. 
where we will broadly try to find optimality conditions for unconstrained optimization problems. In unconstrained optimization problem, the definition of the problem is as follows. Here, in unconstrained optimization, our task is to find a point for which the function fx gets minimum most value. Here by unconstrained we mean the argument of the function f or the variable of the function f is unconstrained to lie in the entire Euclidean dimensional Euclidean space. Here, here there is no constraint in the variable x which is usually referred as decision variable and accordingly the space Rn is also referred as decision variable space. Here the function f is usually referred as objective function or the cost function that we want to minimize. Fine. And in general, x is an n-dimensional real variable. It has n many components and any x is usually presented by in the Euclidean space. In our course of study, we will present any vector by column vector x1, x2 till it has n many components and this is known as decision variable and in our course also let me also put another note here any sequence that we shall consider with superscript the index superscripted index sequence is a sequence of vectors by that I mean all the elements x1, x2, x3, x4 and so on of this sequence are vectors. So by that we refer it is a vector sequence or sequence of vectors. However, if we subscript the index k, then it is a real sequence or a scalar sequence. The, by that I mean it is a sequence of real numbers that x1, x2, all the elements in the sequence, those are real numbers. Fine. So these are few notations that we shall be using in the course of study. In this section of unconstrained optimization, we will consider to discuss this unconstrained problem. And for this problem, we wish to find a point x star such that f of x star is less than or equals to fx for all x in the n-dimensional Euclidean space. We, we used to find this and uh, if such an x star exists then we call this x star a minimizing point or a minimizer or an optimal point of the problem. Mostly we will use the term minimizer also interchangeably we will use minimizing point, minimum point or just a solution of the given problem. This x star is also referred as a global minimum. This x star will be denoted as it is belonging to the set argument of the minimum value of the function fx. By that what do we mean? By that we mean a point x for which fx gets a minimum value is referred as argument. As you all know variable is known as argument of the function. That's why this nomenclature argument of the minimum value of the function f. And if we know x star unique, if x star is unique, somehow if we came to know that if x star is unique, then with an abuse of the notation, uh, we will write not with um, belonging to but with abuse of notation write x star as argument minimum argmin of fx over x belonging to rn. This is abuse of notation because here on the right hand side you have a um, set because this is nothing this this is nothing but a collection of elements is the collection of all the x's for which fx gets the minimum most value and therefore right hand side is a set. On the left hand side then then 
with the appropriate notation you should write it as a single tone set but well in the literature of optimization it is well understood that once you are writing this x star is equal to r mean by that we mean that at x star f gets a global minimum value of the function f in the entire euclidean space r n however for many optimization problem such an extra might not exist for instance i take it suppose minimum of x just the rnd function or you take x cube or whatsoever so or you take x to the power 5 whatsoever you take for them you know that you don't have a point x star for which x star is less than equal to x is not that and for this problem then you don't have any x star and you might feel that x is unbounded above and unbounded below unbounded below and that's why there is no minimum this is not really the fact you might think that the graph of the function looks like this and it is unbounded below and therefore that's why there is no x star for which x star is the global minimum this is not really the fact even if it is bounded below for instance you take this problem e to the power minus x it is really bounded below and it has the following graph is not that however there does not exist any x star for the problem because you don't have any x star by which you have e to the power minus x star is less than equal to e to the power minus x and uh, here um, then before identifying optimality conditions necessary and sufficient optimality condition or characterizations of optimal solutions at first we have to ensure that this problem that you have given me is having at least one solution otherwise at the end of the day although you will apply several theories and with tedious calculations you might go through you can hang out over the day but at the end of the day you will not get any solution and therefore it is essential at first you ensure that your problem is having a solution your problem is having a minimizer then only it is fruitful it is justified to striving for a minimizer fine and therefore in this section i must mention not only optimality conditions but also existence results about the local minimum or global minimum in general we have two particular definitions of minimum those are called as local minimum and global minimum let me mathematically at first define what do we mean by local minimum what do we mean by global minimum and afterwards there is also another notion that strict local minimum which is eventually introduced to refined to resolve one anomaly in the definition of local minimum or global minimum fine so before searching for a minimizer it is important to know that note that there exists one global minimizer and therefore after defining the local minimizer and global minimizer i will spend a little amount of time to give you certain results that ensures that your problem is really having a minimizer and towards that uh, i'll call the extreme value theorem or the westress theorem from from real analysis as well as a new concept coerciveness of a given function will be considered to be discussed and uh, let me also mention here an important fact that uh, in practice most algorithms are able to find only a local minimizer that is not a global minimizer normally finding a global minimizer is you know is a difficult task in many practical applications we are eventually content with getting a local minimizer in addition many global optimization algorithms proceed by solving a sequence of local optimization algorithm and hence in this course our focus is on identifying and analyzing only local solutions or local minimizer and in the entire course of this study by minimizer we will refer only local minimizer however if the problem is a convex optimization problem where you are going to find minimum value of a convex function over a convex set then we will find that local minimizer is eventually a global minimizer and that's why convex optimization is really stronger and we we also have seen on the last day 
that if the derivative value is equal to zero for a convex function, then that particular point at which the derivative value is equal to zero must be a global minimizer. In the next lecture, we will have discussion about uh, discussion about um, the local and global minimizer. And in between, we will also discuss about strict minimizer, strictly local minimizer and strictly global minimizer. And to ensure the existence of a local or global minimizer, uh, for that we will have a few existence results for minimizers. And for existence result, we will find that the notion of coerciveness of a given function is truly fruitful and afterwards if time permits on the next day we will also try to discuss about first order and second order necessary and sufficient condition of optimality. Now let me put a note, a very special note uh, regarding my mistake that I have made and I am really sorry for this. And I put my sincere heartfelt sorry for this. This was regarding a graph that I have drawn that uh, somehow I don't know, somehow it slipped out from my mind that I drew a graph for x to the power 4. And for x to the power 4, I draw a graph that is above y equals to x square. But it is not really the fact. You know there is an intersecting point at minus 1 and 1 and x to the power 4 graph is this one and therefore y equals to x square is not a lower estimate of the function x to the power 4 and eventually there is a result this is going to come in your um, in your problem sheet I have added already I will send you this problem sheet that if there is a function there is a function which is quadratic and eventually if there is a positive constant or other such that fx is above c times x square plus bx plus a where abc are all real then in that case the function f must be a strongly convex function and if you would have y equals to x square lying below y equals to x to the power 4, then x to the power 4 must be a strongly convex function, but that is not really the fact. The function x to the power 4 is a strict convex function, but it is not a strongly convex function. Fine. So I again put my heartfelt sorry due to my mistake. I my mistake on drawing of the graph of the function y equals to x to the power 4 and y equals to x to the power x square. Anyway, so on the next day, then we will try to discuss about all these four things which are going to come in the next lecture. Fine. Well, thank you. Thank you all for your kind presence.